Listen, I try to be nice. I try to be nice. You're mimicking You're me. You're mimicking me. Okay. That is rude, and this conversation is over. Video gaming has become such a massive part of our lives since the 1980s, and still continues today in our modern culture. It has resonated so well with us, and has changed and adapted into the later generations. So seeing that there would be a Disney movie like Wreck-It Ralph, that is based on the many variations of gaming culture and generations, was no surprise of a concept. I remember seeing trailers of this movie years ago, and anticipating to see it in theaters. Sometimes, anticipating to a movie can be just as magical as the experience of the movie itself. And by no surprise, I loved what the movie brought. And rightfully so, many others loved it as well. So much so that it has gained a sequel. As of lately, however, while it does have its following, it arguably hasn't been leveled up with some of the best from what I've heard. But nonetheless, I still enjoy watching this movie, as I am admittedly an endless sucker for Disney films. With the exception of two movies in which the less I talk about the better. Wreck-It Ralph takes place in an arcade joint that borrows the cliché of Toy Story, where all the gaming characters from their own games are brought to life and interact with each other in a power strip called the Game Central Station. The world contains existing titles that are recognized by the audience, but there are three fictional titles that are the major focus. The first of which is Fix-It Felix Jr., which is somewhat of a mixed replica of Donkey Kong and Rampage. Next is Hero's Duty, which is an obvious and giant parody of the many first-person shooter games of the 2000s, like Call of Duty and Gears of War, but with a game engine of Time Crisis. This to me was hysterical, because Disney, of all major film companies, would be the least to expect a parody of that particular game style. If this movie were released at its prime time, they would have never taken on such a thing. And last but not least is Sugar Rush, which is a Mario Kart knockoff, and it's the most focused game in the entire movie. It's amazing that these three dramatically different games are formed together as the main cast. But the way they bounce off each other is quite hysterical. Some obvious cameos are in the movie too, most notably characters from Street Fighter. Zanjif and Bison are just to name a few. But outside of that, there's also Sonic who addresses the severe caution of being in other games, and a handful of other characters such as Bowser, Kano, and Dr. Robotnik. You can tell Disney had to spend a lot of money to Capcom, Nintendo, and Sega to get the rights of having these cameos. Now, technically, any movie can have its own world where a society is held, but it has to be treated with respect. And in this case, this works because it brings what can give them their time off and breaking away from doing something that is eternally routine. It all forms a commentary over their purpose and their roles, which is where Ralph's conflict lies in the central theme. The movie commentates on self-identity, acceptance of who you are, and living with rejection and doing what it takes to be appreciated of who you are. Ralph is one of two characters who deals with this issue. Seeing that he is a villain of his own game, he's unfortunately looked down on without the credibility of what his role serves to the game's programming. This is shortly demonstrated by Gene, who is another character in Ralph's game, and takes Ralph's role too literally. This unfortunate closed-minded mentality is also present in the game's social station, which does its job in getting me to feel for Ralph. Despite the appreciation that audiences can give to villain roles, some people take this way too far. I used to hate villains when I was a kid, but I didn't understand their importance as they serve as a big obstacle for the hero to overcome. Without that role, it doesn't really serve much of a purpose for a hero. So by Ralph's situation, this easily commentates on how much appreciation is needed for playing the villain, especially for those who have this absent mindset. Sadly though, this doesn't go too far as Gene's purpose is to only drive Ralph into jumping into other games. And when he's met again, he snarls at Ralph once more despite the fact that he's what drove Ralph into committing to all these kinds of chaos and even put his own game in jeopardy. He gets no real comeuppance, which to me felt incomplete on Ralph's end. It's a minor but personal complaint, but I would have loved to have seen a much more fitting closure between both him and Ralph. The second of whom that involves struggling to be appreciated is Vanellope. This child goes through some unfortunate circumstances as she gets bullied, hated on, and even outlawed. All of this is because she's a glitch, which on the surface is stated that she's a repercussion to the environment and could lead the game to be out of order. Add an insult to injury, because she's a glitch, she can't even leave her own game. So she's essentially stuck in her own world of hell and can't do anything about it, and it's more depressing and complex compared to Ralph's situation. Unfortunately, until her character is fully fleshed out, her first appearance is sour as she makes Ralph's time difficult and mean-spirited. So it was kind of difficult at first in getting me to feel for Vanellope, but when the moments hit, it hits hard. In fact, one of my favorite scenes in the movie is when Ralph is forced to destroy Vanellope's cart, which was built earlier in the movie. 
It's a very heart-wrenching and painful moment to watch, as her chances of finally fulfilling her goal of getting respect is all crushed in a matter of seconds. All of this was for the safety of a supposed danger that was stated by King Candy, supposedly the runner of Sugar Rush, who I'll save for later. As this is going on, Felix is with Sergeant Calhorn, who is the lead role of Hero's Duty, and they are also in Sugar Rush to find both Ralph and a Cybug, which is a creature from Hero's Duty, and is harvesting a herd that'll cause a massacre within the game's environment, and eventually the entire game's central station. The two of them share an odd but effective chemistry, and I would have loved to have seen this explored a bit more. I mean, you have a retro character with a modern character together, and it's interactive with how the contrast personalities are bouncing off each other. It's even worth pointing out that Felix is a carpenter who fixes things, and Calhorn is a soldier who's relied on destruction through intense gunnery. They're comparatively main protagonists in their own games, and they have their own obstacles to deal with. Calhorn has a tragic backstory programmed within her, which explains her aggressive personality, and considering that she's a fairly new character developed, it's a challenge for Felix as he has feelings for her. Felix, on the other hand, was surprising to me as my expectations were different before I saw the movie. Considering that Ralph wanted to earn respect, I expected Felix to become jealous and declining of his own success as a main character and have the movie's role switched around. But in all actuality, both Felix and Ralph get along naturally and level-headedly instead of coming off as, Well, no, I'm the main hero of my game, so I always earn respect. And I'm glad Felix wasn't written that way, because it would have been so uninspiring and boring to watch. In fact, during the feud between Ralph and Jean, Felix tried to fuse in the situation. Additionally, given Felix's circumstances of being successful all the time, he's challenged similarly to what Ralph was dealing with before, as he learns what Ralph wanted to do. Speaking of villains, I have to give King Candy credit where it's due. Throughout the movie, there's a term called Going Turbo, which is coined off of a rebellious and dangerous character of the same name, who jumped to another game after it was stealing his thunder in popularity. This resulted in getting both his and the other game taken out. It isn't as mentioned very often, and whenever it's used, it reflects on what Ralph was doing, so to speak. However, we slowly learn that King Candy, who not only enjoys being at the top ranks in Sugar Rush, but also is a bit diabolical, as his actions are why Vanellope has suffered these unfortunate circumstances. This is going into spoiler territory here, but it's revealed that he was Turbo the whole time. As of the many releases, Disney tended to write a villain character who's revealed through a twist after midway or upon the film's climax. While that is a nice spin on the character role, it's a bit of a risk factor for how the audience connects with them. To quote Doug Walker in his editorial on what happened at Great Disney villains, they became different people in which we were introduced to so late that the audience has to re-identify with them. For the most part, he's right. Prospector and Hot to Lucky Bear from Toy Stories 2 and 3 are set examples along with money-greeting characters from Tarzan and Atlantis. Hans from Frozen being the most blatant example as it appears right the hell out of nowhere. That being said, Turbo in Wreck-It Ralph is one of the best examples to get it right, the other of which being La Cruz from Coco. This works because the personality of King Candy is essentially the same and we see how he pushes himself to keep his rank throughout the movie. And surprisingly, his predictable and competitive nature was so underplayed because of how focused the movie was with the other cast. So when he's finally revealed to be Turbo, instead of rolling my eyes, I reacted with, Holy shit, that makes too much sense. How did I not see that coming? Some would find it predictable if they did compare and contrast King Candy and Turbo earlier in the movie, but I was still impressed with this revealance. One final note to add is that I love the credit sequence. It's silly bringing that up since a lot of recent Disney movies have included this as a current standard, but every time I watch this, I always smile at the endless references, including Doom from Hero's Duty, while it briefly recaps the film's narrative. This is more of a personal reason since I'm a fan of retro games, so that shouldn't come off surprising at all. Also, I really love listening to When Can I See You Again. It's one of my favorite songs from Owl City, next to Fireflies and Shooting Star. It's so happy and uplifting, and it greatly contrasts my taste in music, which for the most part consists of bands of rock and metal. Just something I wanted to add on top of reviewing this movie. That being said and done, this movie isn't perfect, but it's more than satisfying enough for me to appreciate the movie's style, theme, and overall connection I get out of it, as I find it very relatable to fans of arcades and retro games like me. But even if you're not, it's still an enjoyable movie on a general basis, with its characters that dive into theme of accepting who you are and embracing it. I haven't seen this movie since I saw it in theaters, and when watching it again, I still think it holds up. It's fun, well-paced, certainly worth your time. I definitely recommend it. To the final rating, I give Wreck-It Ralph four and a half stars. Thank you for watching. This is Golden Fox, and take care.